While we mostly focus on the cars themselves on this channel, there are occasionally a few things that merit discussion that didn't specifically relate to the vehicles themselves, and this is one of those cases. In 1971, Chevrolet introduced their new compact car to the world, and that was the Chevrolet Vega. Now, no matter what you think about the Vega, it had a number of interesting and innovative features, some of which were highly successful, and some of them, like its initial aluminum block engine before it became the Durabilt 2300 engine in the Vega, were certainly not. However, one of the most interesting things about the Vega, and perhaps in all of General Motors history, is not about the car itself, which we're going to cover in a series of separate videos, but rather how the car was actually shipped to dealers. Most of the time when cars were shipped to the assembly plants back in the early 1970s, it was done by rail. And this was not the form of transportation that you see today where you have these big enclosed rail cars where the cars are relatively protected from the elements as well as vandalism. Back in the early 1970s, cars were mostly shipped by open rail car. And so damage, either through vandalism or natural weather events, was actually pretty common when these vehicles were shipped. It's one of the reasons why you often find that there may be very low mileage original cars out there that were repainted by the dealer simply because they were damaged in transit. One of the solutions for this was General Motors in the 1970s developed long trains that the goal of them was to run nonstop from an origin to a destination, thereby minimizing the ability for vandals to get a hold of the cars and do things like spray paint them or steal components off of them. However, the Vega took a totally different approach that enabled it not only to be protected from the elements in shipping, but also to have a more efficient way of stacking the car within the rail car. And this was the Southern Pacific and General Motors combined engineering effort on what was called the Vertipak rail car design. The idea for this Vertipak design was really hatched when the president of Southern Pacific Railways got to talking with General Motors' Ed Cole, for whom the Chevrolet Vega was really his baby. And Ed Cole eventually advanced to the presidency of General Motors. The idea behind the Vertipak rail cars was that the Vegas, as previously mentioned, could be shipped more tightly and thus more could fit per rail car, reducing the overall logistics cost. A side benefit was that these Vertipak rail cars kept the vehicles completely enclosed, so they were less easily vandalized. The Vertipak process included lowering the sides of the rail car, then having the Vegas drive up on the sides of the rail car, then be secured to the rail car door, and then a forklift would push the rail car door up so the vehicles were sitting vertically in the rail car for transport. This had never been done before, and you can imagine there were a number of engineering challenges associated with shipping a car in a nose-down position as opposed to just shipping it level on quote-unquote all fours. More specifically, in order for Chevrolet to fit 30 Vegas on each rail car as opposed to 18 in normal transportation, the Vegas had to have some specific features so that when they went nose up, they didn't have significant issues when the rail car doors were then lowered and they were attempted to be driven off of the transportation car and shipped to dealers. The first of these modifications was that the Chevrolet Vega had to have a modified oil pan such that when the car went vertical, it didn't just drain all the oil into the number one cylinder. Thus, engineers did put a baffle in the pan to preclude this from happening, which really served no other purpose than what I just mentioned. It wasn't something that was put in the oil pan for performance reasons or to enable the car to handle more easily and not starve for oil at the same time. So the baffle served no other purpose than just to preclude oil from entering the number one cylinder when the car went nose up. Another feature that the cars had to have modified was the batteries, because you can imagine if the batteries were filled from the top, acid would simply drip out of the battery, and that would cause a whole host of problems. Consequently, the filler caps for the NOS Vega batteries 
were set high on the rear edge of the case of the battery, as opposed to being on the top like most normal batteries. Next, the Vega carburetors also had to be modified so that fuel didn't just drip all over the place when the cars went vertical. And so carburetors on the Vegas had a little tube that enabled gas to drain out of the carburetor and into the charcoal vapor canister. Then when the car went back to being horizontal, that fuel would return to the carburetor as opposed to just spilling all over. Another feature that Vegas had to help them in the case of this type of shipment was that the washer bottles were placed at a 45 degree angle so that they didn't spill as well. Engineers also created various spacers and wedges to wedge into the mounting systems for the powertrain such that they weren't damaged during shipment. And those were both inserted prior to the cars being placed in the rail car and then simply just taken off as the cars exited the rail car. So as you can see, there were a number of modifications to the car itself in order for it to be shipped in this form. And the rail cars and the rail systems also had to make some modifications or at least be very careful when shipping the vehicles. Clearly, the rail cars themselves were unique and were only used by the Vega and, to my knowledge, never used to ship a car like this before or since. But one of the consequences of shipping the car nose down was that the rail cars had become relatively high. And so they had to travel through certain specific routes where there were no low underpasses in order to ensure that the cars arrived safely. This was not a consideration that normal rail shipment had really thought of because the cars were obviously shipped with four wheels on the ground. Overall, the idea of shipping vehicles this way was quite interesting. And like I said, I have never seen this before or since. And you can imagine there were certain efficiencies gained from being able to pack 30 Vegas in a rail car as opposed to the normal 18 that was often seen in shipment. However, my guess is that this VertiPack system really didn't deliver on the intended benefits. You can imagine that all the engineering modifications drove up the vehicle cost and it took extra time to load the cars into the rail car because you had to drive them up on the side ramp, then use a forklift to move the door all the way vertical. And then on top of all that, the rail cars had to follow specific railways as opposed to being able to traverse across a broader network of railways. And my guess is that given the relative cost of all these different modifications that the VertiPack system just really didn't make sense from an economic standpoint. It was probably one of those interesting ideas that perhaps saved a bit of money in principle or in the initial business case. But once all the unintended consequences were factored in, and my guess is there were also some challenges in loading these vehicles that probably weren't factored into the business case or just simple errors that operators made when loading them that were atypical from the normal loading procedures simply because People weren't used to loading cars this way. So when all that was factored in, my guess is that the VertiPack system really didn't save any money. And as a consequence, it went away and was never used again. However, it does represent one of the most interesting engineering feats that perhaps General Motors ever put together. And I haven't seen a company try to attempt something similar either before or since. Hope you enjoyed this feature on the Chevrolet Vega VertiPack system. If you did, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and check out the video thumbnails at bottom left and right for some suggestions for you, and stay tuned for a full-length feature on the Chevrolet Vega.